So this is Garden District Webinar 1, Home Energy Efficiency. And it's something that we've put together over the past um, month and got the uh, various guest speakers in. Um, so we've got Fintree Development Trust. We've got, um, sorry, I'm gonna just forward that there so that you can see here, the running order. In fact, we're starting with Home Energy Scotland and that's Jamie Noble. Fintree Development Trust, Kate Howell and Gordon uh, Cowden, Cowden, sorry, and Kishon Insulations. We've got Mike Baumeister, and from JD McKenzie Construction, we've got James McKenzie, and then there's myself, you and Bush. If we have time, I'll finish off with a bit about double glazing and doors. Um, so, with no further ado, I think we can ask if um, Jamie could yes. could do his bit. So I'm going to switch back to screens and Jamie's going to share something from his end. Thank you. And, and welcome everyone, by the way, to this event. Um, I can see a lot of people have joined. It's great. Thank you, Ewan. Uh, as Ewan says, my name's Jamie Noble. I work for Home Energy Scotland as a uh, home energy specialist. I'm going to talk uh, about fabric improvements today um, with particular focus on insulation types and key considerations. Um, as we've only got 10 minutes to, to go through this, it started off at 20 minutes, so I'll uh, be brief on, on the different sections. So Home Energy Scotland, for those of you who don't know, is a, a a Scottish government funded programme and that's to provide in partial energy advice. So that covers advice on insulation, renewables, um, as well as our things like EVs and, and so forth. And we'll also look at uh, eligibility for government funded schemes. Uh, I would say we don't, we don't cold call. Um, so we either take calls in through our advice centre or we uh, take referrals in from groups like the Garvin District Development Trust. Um, so when we're looking at the fabric, uh, we're looking at four elements. Uh, so we're looking at the roof, openings, which windows and doors, floors and walls. Um, I'm not going to go through all the different types of improvements because um, that would take too long. But when we're looking at improvements, we're looking at improving the thermal uh, performance of the building without, uh, with, while maintaining um, uh, structural integrity as well as um, uh, making sure uh, the the environment and the home is good for the people that stay there as well. Uh, in terms of insulation types, uh, so you've got rigid foam insulation boards, so PIR, PUR, so that's things like Kingspan, Celtex, that type of insulation. That type of insulation um, is non-permeable system, so it's got a vapor membrane on it. So you tend to find them in modern builds like timber frame, uh, where that type of material is suitable. Um, in terms of retrofitting, uh, you've, where a where it's added appropriately, um, it, it can work. It can it can be very thermally efficient as an insulation, uh, but you've got to think about in, uh, the fabric of of the building. So, for example, if it's a stone build and you're internally insulating, you've got to think about uh, the breathability because you're changing the nature of the building. So, a stone build would originally be something like lath and plaster. Uh, with uh, lime on the stone, uh, with some breathability and moisture movement, you're changing that, uh, the condition of build if you use an insulation type like that. You also need to think about things like interstitial condensation because um, because they are thermally efficient. Um, if you improve the U value too much, uh, you can move the dew point in the stone uh, and into the middle of the stone. Um, and you can cause uh, what's called interstitial condensation. So that's a build up of moisture in the stone. Um, they can also be used externally to insulate as well. Uh, and with external insulation, 
um, you're making sure that uh, that insulation is protected from uh, from the environmental conditions like uh, moisture and rain, that type of thing. So um, the next one is expanded polystyrene boards or cavity fill. Uh, I'm sure James will go into this in a bit more detail on, uh, later on when he speaks about his work. Um, but the expanded polystyrene boards uh, can be used for external insulation uh, or it can be used as a cavity fill as well, expanded polystyrene. Again, when you're insulating uh, the walls, you've got to think about um, how it in the cavity, for example, you've got to think about how it affects uh, the ventilation. So when they're looking at the suitability of the cavity, there needs to be enough of a gap inside. So 40 mil uh, or two inches uh, or, or greater. Um, also looking at the condition of, uh, for cavity wall, looking at the condition of the external weave. So the, the harlan, making sure that's in good condition as well as um, ongoing maintenance for things like gutters uh, and that will come into it with external wall insulation as well, maintaining things like gutters so that you're minimising uh, uh, moisture ingress uh, into the insulation. Other uh, types of min uh, insulation, so mineral wool, so that could be, uh, for example, glass, rock wool or sheep's wool. Uh, they'll have different Properties depend on what material they use. So, for example, sheep's wool has got high breathability and moisture permeability and can be uh, suitable for uh, more traditional properties. So, for a loft insulation, uh, suspended floor insulation, for example. Uh, rock wool is maybe not so permeable in insulation. Um, so, when you're applying that, uh, maybe applying it, uh, for example, in a uh, timber frame. It can also be used ex externally, rock wool uh, as well. In terms of other fibre boards, so you've got uh, hemp and wood fibre. Uh, these are, uh, again, permeable insulation types, so suitable in uh, traditional builds uh, where, you need, where you want to, to maintain that moisture movement and breathability internally and looking at uh, also spray foam. Uh, so Mike's here today to talk about isonine, which is termed breathable or moisture permeable insulation. Some spray foams are non-permeable or low permeability. So we've got to think about how that affects the ventilation. So if it's sprayed in the laugh, for example, um, you'd want uh, High breathability, high permeability to maintain um, to maintain the, the moisture movement that was there uh, before. Uh, cellulose as well, uh, so that's loose uh, cellulose fiber that can be sprayed into insulation systems. So uh, into like a, a a stud or timber frame, um, and then sealed uh, sealed plasterboard. Polystyrene beads, not so common these days, but uh, they have been used for insulating uh, lath and plaster. Uh, although the polystyrene itself is not breathable, the, uh, there's breathability in the, the bonds, so uh, it is suitable for things like lath and plaster. So the key consideration, I mean, the first thing, or the first things really, to consider is the cost, space, and disruption versus benefit. And when we're doing, when we're giving our advice or out in our surveys, that's what we're looking at, the, the, the benefit, uh, the potential costs, and what that'll mean uh, in terms of disruption as well. Um, so in terms of the benefit, uh, that will depend on how you're currently heating your home or how you'd like to heat your home. Because um, often, will come across houses where they're underheating their home and would like a warmer home. So it's looking at if you increase the heat to the home and you have and you improve the, uh, the insulation or the glazing, how much is that going to cost to run uh, your heating system? 
or if you're changing your heating system. So if you've got, uh, if you're planning on putting on a, a renewable system, like a air source heat pump, and improving your insulation, draft proofing, glazing, make that more suitable and more uh, cost effective to run as well. Existing fabric type and the condition of the fabric, as I was saying earlier, uh, insulation using the, uh, applied to the pro appropriately to appropriate material um, it is what you're looking for there. And also the condition of the fabric as well. So is there is there uh, damp there? What's caused? If there is damp, what's causing the dampness? Uh, and as mentioned there, or was mentioned earlier, how you your home ventilate so air and moisture movement. Uh, and well, you need to put in extra ventilation. Uh, and uh, how will the for the home itself, but also for the, the different fabric areas. So for example, with loft insulation, if you're increasing loft insulation, the air above the loft insulation will cool, it'll become cooler. Is there enough ventilation to deal with the, the extra moisture that that will cause by becoming cooler? So well, you need to put in extra vents, for example. Um, it's the installer managing the whole job. So what, the cost, then the installation cost that they're quoting is that what does that cover? And um, do you have to manage other contractors yourself? Uh, and then maintenance, in, insulation generally doesn't need a lot of maintenance. When we're talking about maintenance, it's more maintenance that you should be looking at anyway with your home. Um, it's just I suppose more important when you're putting money out to something that you don't want to uh, dam, you don't want to cause any damage to that insulation. So, so saying earlier, uh, with when you're looking at cavity wall and external wall insulation, making sure you're maintaining the gutters, the drain, good having good drainage as well. Inside the house, maintaining good ventilation as well. So where you've got high high moisture, areas of high moisture, like the kitchen, bathroom, looking at maybe extractor fans, uh, so that you're reducing the risk of things like condensation dampness. When you're looking at installers as well, uh, what sort of quality assurance are you getting in customer protection? And uh, so what type of warranty, what does that warranty cover? And what are your responsibilities um, around that warranty in terms of uh, maintenance. And of course, paperwork before and after. So getting an uh, paperwork detail in the job, uh, what's involved and the, the different uh, details of the different costs involved. And then afterwards, things like uh, warranties. So and maintenance schedules as well, making sure you have that for yourself or to pass on to new owners as well. Paperwork is also important. So uh, when you're looking at uh, future improvements as well. So because if you're insulating the walls, for example, um, you're changing the nature of the, the property. If someone looks to do double glazing later on, does that, uh, is that double glazing uh, have ventilation in it? Well, you need to, to look at ventilating in different ways as well. So moving on to what funding's available. So there's Warmer Home Scotland, uh, which is a, a Scottish government grant uh, and that's managed by Warmworks. So that's an upfront grant either to cover the full cost or part of the cost of <clears throat> various insulation and heating uh, improvements. Uh, Warmworks manages the contractors uh, for that. There's area-based schemes. So uh, that's run by the local authorities. So for the Highland Council, they've, uh, EON manages the, the, con uh, the, 
area base scheme for the Highland Council. And they, in terms of insulation, they're looking at external wall, cavity wall and loft insulation. Uh, in terms of criteria, that's based on council tax band um, and also the energy efficiency of the property can come into that as, as well. And that that's usually for external wall, there'll be a contribution. Uh, for cavity wall and loft, there might be a, con a contribution. For those that don't qualify or want to go for a different type of insulation or heating, they can go through the Home Energy Scotland loan and cashback scheme. So there's interest-free loans with up to 40% cashback for various insulation improvements. So for example, for solid wall insulation, there's up to 10,000 pounds available, with up to 40% cashback, which is uh, up to 4,000 pounds. For, for that, you have to manage the <coughs> installers or you choose your installer and you manage them there are cer certain conditions that apply to the installer depending on the type of improvement and um, so the the uh, for example for solid wall insulation the installer needs to be green deal accredited i'm not going to go through the renewable technologies uh to date so that's in terms of support you're lucky enough to have Ewan Bush, who's got lots of experience uh, in the building trade, so he can help support by asking the right questions of installers and dealing with installers. Uh, and he can al he also uh, works with herself uh, there at Home Energy Scotland. Uh, there's also support through in Historic Environment Scotland for people living in traditional builds. Um, so they've got advice and support on their website, or you can contact their technical team as well. Hopefully, hopefully that that's was great. a good time. <laughs> any questions? Think, thank you, Jamie. Yeah, that's that's great. If, if, if anyone's got any questions, there's a way of um, using the chat function to type them in if you don't want to be heard. But if those of you who would like to ask a question... Stuff. You're welcome to do so. So to recap, Jamie, um, I can't see any questions coming in yet. Uh, so basically there's, there's quite a few different options available and it seems like depending on how your house is built, that's really one of the, the criteria. Is there a message here from Tina coming in? <clears throat> Let's see. No, Ewan, I've oh. got a message. No messages. Nope. Oh, it was an old email popped up on my screen. <laughs> it's gone away now, so that's good. Um, anyone in the the group or energy group might have any other questions that you would like to ask? Not, not so much a question, Ewan, but a statement that uh, aren't we lucky that we've got an energy officer to help us navigate through the uh, the different options and uh, issues attached. So, uh, yeah, that's that's why we have, um, you know, we're lucky to have uh, Ewan to help people through that process. But that's all I need to say. Thank okay, you. great. Well, I think we should move on. Um, thank you, Jamie. That was that's really useful um, introduction. So we're moving on now. To Fintry, isn't it? I think so. I believe. Let's see. Yeah. Do you want to share your screen, Gordon? Yeah, I'll give it a go. Um, bear with me for a second. Mm -hmm. We haven't rehearsed this double act actually for this evening, so bear with yeah. us as we talk. Okay. Over, shall I? Anything, anything That's might cool. happen. You're welcome. Just take it easy. It's all very casual here. And... Mm -hmm. uh, okay, let's try that one. Is that is that working? Yep. 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 Yeah, you can see that okay? Yes, yes. we can. Okay, great. Um, 
Well, yeah, thanks very much for, for asking us along this evening. Um, what we're going to do is just, we've got a little presentation here um, uh, that gives a bit of background about kind of who we are and, and where we came from um, and uh, talks a bit about some of the home energy efficiency projects that we've done um, and also talks a little bit about some other other stuff that we've done over the over the years. <coughs> um, my my name's Gordon Cowton. Um, I I've been involved with the Development Trust since the since the outset, pretty much. And uh, my colleague Kate Howell um, is with us this evening as well, and she's the the manager at the trust and has also been involved pretty much from the beginning as well. Um, so uh, yeah. Let's, um, let's crack on, if I can get this to go, yay. Okay, so um, some of you might know this already, but um, our background story is that, that uh, we started off life um, kind of way back in about 2003, 2004, um, when we um, looked to do a deal with our local um, wind farm that was being built with, with the developer and the, out, the outcome of that was that we um, uh, own the output from a, a two and a half megawatt wind turbine um, that's on the hills near, nearby the village um, and all through our lives en energy and energy use and uh, greenhouse gas emissions have been Kind of very much the focus of, of, of what we've done. Um, uh, but we ha have done other other projects as well. Um, as it says, they are ranging from smart meters to, to beehives. Um, and uh, yeah, it would, would, would be here all evening if we're going to tell it all. Um, so we'll try and, try and focus. Um, so uh, a little bit about Fintry. Uh, it's it's a fairly small village uh, in the in the Campsies, not far north of Glasgow. Um, about three hundred thirty five households and the adult population of about six hundred. Um, there's a primary school. Uh, there's a village hall and a sports club. Um, a lot of people commute to um, uh, Glasgow, Edinburgh, and Stirling to work. Um, a key point for the work that we've done over the years is that the village isn't on mains gas. So um, a lot of people heat their homes through LPG or um, oil or um, just straight electricity. Um, and uh, energy bills tend to be quite a focus for people because of that. Um, we've got a wide variety of housing stock. Um, ranging from uh, you know, 300, 400 year old cottages um, through to houses built in the last few years. Um, and also there's no, uh, there's no public transport to speak of in, in the village, which is significant as well. Um, that's a picture of the village um, from nearby hill. Uh, and and it, it always looks like that. It's never gray and overcast. It's it's always it's always green and bucolic and sunny. Um, <clears throat> so in terms of of home energy efficiency projects that we've done, um, actually the very first project that we did, kind of delivering uh, anything within the within the village within the community, had a a, a very large insulation um, element to it. And this was back in about 2008, 2009. Um, and we did a, a survey of um, the entire housing stock of the village. Um, on offer was free cavity wall and roofing insulation. Um, and we're also doing some consciousness raising as well. So we provided free energy meters and um, infrared images for all homes. Um, we have a story about um, infrared images and the wisdom or not of someone wandering around at, around at night taking photos of people's houses. Um, but I'll save that for another another occasion. Nearly made um, the news, I think. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. nearly made the news and got somebody arrested. Um, uh, 
we also provided uh, energy lessons to the local primary school and um, yeah, that project was part funded by ourselves, but also um, Climate Challenge Fund money and a fund that was around at the time called CERTS, which I think has been superseded by various eco um, funds since then. Um, it, it was a pretty successful project and, and really for us, it, we, as our first project in the in the community, it probably couldn't have gone much better. Um, we managed to survey about 75% of housing and about 46% of them were able to receive free insulation. Um, and um, yeah, we think it made a significant difference to uh, a lot of the homes in, in the community. Um, <clears throat> the other kind of very specific project that was aimed at uh, uh, home energy efficiency was we ha have a street um, that uh, was built, um, I think, in the early 50s. Kate, yeah. is that right? I think yeah. So. yeah. Um, and these these are, uh, it's a street of, of Cruden homes, um, which had very, very poor levels of insulation. Um, I'm not the world's expert on this, but my understanding is that the, the walls are basically kind of sheets of, of prefabricated um, concrete with no cavity or anything there at all. Um, they are hard to treat. So in the, in the first project we did, there wasn't a huge amount that um, these homes could benefit from. Um, so we, we kind of looked at a way of, of, of doing something that might work for them. Um, and really the answer was um, external cladding, um, which was, is a pretty expensive thing to do. <clears throat> um, we're working with um, with Stirling Council over a number of years. I think all of these houses ultimately had external um, cladding insulation installed on them. Which uh, I was I was trying to see when I was uh, when I was helping Kate put this presentation together. I was trying to see if we'd got any before and after photos, but I couldn't find any. So the the photo I've got there is just is just after. Um, so. You know, as well as um, improving the insulation, also improved the the, the appearance of the houses. Um, so, you know, again, it was a it was a pretty successful project, and I think all the householders were very pleased with the outcome. Um, one of the kind of more general things that we've done around energy efficiency is um, for quite a few years we employed. Um, uh, energy advisors um, and a, one of the roles or the role of these energy advisors as general was to help people improve the energy efficiency of their homes. Um, th this could be through, you know, kind of anything really um, ranging from installing um, thermostatic valves onto, onto radiators through to um, installing ground source heat pumps. Um, uh, and we ran a number of, of, of draft, draft proofing um, workshops um, and, and produced kind of information for householders who wanted to improve um, the, um, uh, the draft, the draftiness of their homes. Um, uh, so that, that, was, that was one thing that we've done. Another thing we, that we've done is over the years, a number of times we've run our own energy shows. And these have been for both, uh, kind of aimed at both people in the community and, and people outside. Um, and we've had a number of, of kind of events and, and, and speakers and so on at these. And, and again, part of this is, is focusing on energy efficiency. Um, and so on. Um, we haven't run one for a few years now because um, they were really hard work to put together um, and quite um, quite stressful as well, actually. Um, they were successful in, in they, raising awareness, especially people who were maybe considering uh, a micro-renewables. We had some installed, the sort of early adopters were helpful in sort of opening up their homes and letting crowds of people arrive to look at air source heat pumps and ground source heat pumps or solar PV and that, that makes a huge difference. If you can see a neighbour or a fellow 
you know, village resident has gone ahead with it, it takes away some of the kind of um, scare factor and talk mm -hmm. to somebody that you may know that's already done the job. So they were they were useful events. That's great. Um, we've also done work with the primary school, um, uh, set up a, a thing called the Carbon Cutter Police um, uh, so that the kids could go home and pester their parents about um, turning turning lights off and <clears throat> um, making making better use of energy and so on. Um, and we also did um, some uh, outdoor planting work in the in uh, in the school as well. Um, and then the other thing that we've done is uh, for a number of years we ran um, our own household grant scheme, where. Uh, any householder who was wanting to make an improvement to their home um, with regards to energy use, they could apply um, to us for a grant. And the grants were, if I remember correctly, Kate, they were £500 or £1,000. That's right, depending on your circumstances, um, um, £500 was the norm. Yeah, uh, and uh, we, we tend to take a fairly liberal approach on this. So, uh, you know, if, if something was... As long as as long as the 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 um, the measure was going to have some uh, improvement on energy efficiency, it, we tended to um, to be happy to provide a grant for it. Um, so you know we gave quite a few grants for for insulation, quite a few for upgrades to um, to windows and doors um, and so on, um, as well as kind of big, bigger things like um, solar PV. Um, and uh, biomass and, and heat pumps and that type of thing. Um, so that's a, a breakdown of, of all the things that we that we funded with the grants. Um, and in terms of the, the various things that we've done over the years, um, the, the funding really came from a variety of different sources. Um, uh, we've tended to kind of take the view to you know, although we have money that comes into us via our relationship with the wind farm, um, we've, we've done what we can to, to kind of spread that out, to find other funds to, um, to use alongside that. So as I said, the first, the very first project was a mixture of CCF money, certs and our own funds. The hard to treat homes were um, funded from eco funding via the, the local council in Stirling. Um, energy advisors were fu funded largely by Climate Challenge Fund, but but also input from our own wind farm funds as well. Um, and then our, our own household grant scheme was funded entirely from from our own our own money um, that we had kind of complete control over. Um, so it was very much, as uh, I say, a matter of of, of using different funds um, uh, where where possible. Um, to, to spread the money around. Um, so that's 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 basically all 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 I've got to say. I've got a feeling I've gone through that very quickly. Um, so right. you know, more than happy to to take any questions anybody's got. That's great. Thank you, Gordon. No, I think that was it was good a good pace. So um, yeah, any questions? Want to stop sharing your screen, Sarah? Yeah. Yeah, let me just work out how to do that. That's it. Is that, yeah? Yeah. If nobody's, if nobody's got anything to say, um, <clears throat> I have to say that what Fintry has achieved is exceptional. Um, you seem to have made things happen when government stuff has just dressing on stuff, change the, you know, the way that they fund things and stuff like that. And I think it really does show you what can be achieved if a community takes this sort of project on. So that's the first thing. Um, <clears throat> do you have many local authority rented accommodation within the village? That's a good question. No, we don't. Um, We've hardly got any, actually there's hardly any local authority or um, housing association accommodations. So the vast majority of the housing um, is owner occupier and there's a small amount of privately rented as well. And I think, 
I think there are two houses that might be owned by the local authority, but that's it. Yeah. Have you been able to involve these people in the project as such, as far as improvements are concerned? or? Um, do, you, do you mean the local authority or...? or? Well, I noticed that the, obviously the hard, uh, the hard to treat houses, the Cruden homes, yeah. presuming they were privately owned, but yeah. um, the Stirling Council took a, a major lead in actually bringing them up to, sh to shape, you know, which is possibly the sort of thing you would expect them to do with um, their own housing stock, which we rent out. I mean, yeah. the, the reason I'm asking the question is that obviously behind all of this is a local um, development company project to actually bring in a grant scheme to, to help with the, well, basically two things that Jamie said in his presentation was the cost of this and the fact that in a lot of cases there's a contribution required and that's often the thing that stops people actually doing this stuff. So we're looking at ways of actually using the, the, the funds to, to, to make these things happen. And one of the questions is that, you know, I, I think about, is it 30% of our housing stocks rental of some sort? I still know the answer to this. Uh, yes, we 30% was was the figure. Um, there's an additional 20 or something. It's split up into various, um, whether it's, because we've got a lot of estate owned houses here as well. Um, so it's people renting off the estates as well as the housing association. Oh, is there a housing association? I'm not so sure. It's the council, the Highland Council. Council of, housing. Yeah. It's, yeah, it's council housing, isn't it? Genuine. <coughs> so this is one of the challenges of whenever you're <coughs> designing a community grant scheme to supplement, you know, the like of the work that Jamie, Jamie can provide is making sure that everybody gets a fair bite of the cherry. You know, yep. and that's something yep. that's thrown back at us by the funders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I, I'm not sure kind of how many words of wisdom we, we have on that one, to be honest. As, as I say, there's, there's very little um, uh, council housing in, in the area. Um, and although there is some privately rented, it's, it's, it's again, a very small proportion of it. Um, I, I do have a recollection that Kate, you, you can perhaps correct me on this. I do have a re recollection of maybe getting some grant applications in from folk who had who were either the owners or the or the the, the renters in in. Yeah, we have. Um, we, we we never um, had any kind of. Um, it, it didn't matter where the application came from, as long as you were a Fintry re uh, resident. That was the criteria. Um, yeah. So yes, we did. Um, even on simple things like draft proofing and so on, we were able because they would be limited if they were rented property to what they could actually do to their homes. So yeah. any of the like, grant funding that we were able to provide, you know, had to be something fairly simple in a lot of cases. So draft proofing was was one that I know that we did for one of the the flats in Main Street. Yeah. Did you allow landlords to apply for the funding? If they were rent, if say a private landlord. If I if I remember rightly, and this is a, is a number of years ago, I think we did have mm -hmm. someone ask if they could do that, and we decided that it had to be the home occupier that um, okay. applied for the funding and not the landlords. So um, sorry, were there examples then of where the tenant applied for the grant but needed the landlord's permission to go ahead? Good question. <laughs> End of the circumstances now. Um, when we did this, um, yes, I think they actually did. That that sounds familiar. Um, I, I think actually how that came about, and I might be, be getting my memories mixed up here, but I think when the landlord asked for grant funding, we had decided that it's best coming from the resident, and when the he encouraged his residents to apply for the, the grant funding. I think that's how it went. It's, uh, okay. and, and they were successful? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Our, our uh, goals were definitely to drive down, you know, sort of um, carbon footprint and help. Yeah. Mm. And, and as, as, as I said, we, we tended to be, we tend to err on the side of, of generosity. Mm. Um, so, you know, you, you really had to be applying for something that was that was completely out of, out of, out of bounds, 
to be to be rejected. That's great. Well, I think just looking Sorry, at can I, oh, one other quick question. One last question, John. Yeah. Right. OK. Um, <laughs> you quoted in your slides that you had spent, I think, £87,000 on what you described as relatively small grants to support individual households. Mm -hmm. But clearly the value of the work that's been done in total, including that that was funded by Sterling Council or from other funding sources, must have been considerably greater. How much greater? Uh, yeah, considerably. Considerably. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we, we don't have <laughs> off, a total for that. Off my head, don't, I don't have a total. Yeah, mm -hmm. because uh, you know, I think if you're going to do that, you'd you'd have to count, you know, things like like staff time and so on, because that's that's had a that's had a significant effect. You know, having ha having somebody involved who's who's helping householders through. Yeah. The kind of the kind of grant process or whatever you know that's a that's a so um yeah mm. is it a figure that you don't... could capture at some time in the future or you know to give us a flavor uh, we could... a i think because there's been so many different um measures on so many different homes i mean for instance even the the grant the the household grants that we were we were giving out um we ran the system for about three four years and then we decided to stop at that point and then re-offer them. So people who were interested in doing work and reducing the carbon footprint would reapply. In other words, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't, you know, right. so not, yep. not everyone took up the offer of the grants. Um, mm -hmm. So yep. th there's so many different applications, so many different sort of sources of funding that you'd need to apply to each and every individual home that I think that'd be quite a difficult one to do. Okay, thank you very much. Great. That, that's really been wonderful to hear your story there. So, um, are, are you going to stay in the meeting or? Uh, yep. Yeah. I was I was planning to hang yeah. hang around. Yeah, if that's okay. That's fine. Quite, quite nosy. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. So, what's Thank next, you. Tina? I think we've got. Am I right in thinking it's Kishon Insulation now? I think so. I think so. That sounds familiar. Yeah. 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 There you go, Mike. Off you go. Get my screen shared. Okay. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for inviting us or myself to come and speak to you all. Um, my name is Mike Baumeister. I'm the operations manager at Kishorn Installations. Um, this evening, I was just going to give you a little bit of a run through about who we are and um, where we've come from, um, about how we operate, uh, about the product we install, um, and then I've got some photos of some previous jobs that we've done, so you can see the variety of work that we're able to do. Um, we basically we started out as a building contractor uh, on the west coast of Scotland, funnily enough, in Kishore, um, and we were building energy efficient homes. Um, we found that really the key to creating uh, an energy efficient home was ensuring the air tightness. Um, but a lot of the solutions at the time uh, relied on tapes and membranes to achieve that, which is fairly difficult to, to guarantee and also very time consuming to carry out. Um, that kind of started us on this search to, to find a, a better solution. You know, this world of technology, there's, there's got to be a better way of doing things. Um, and that led us to find isonine which uh, was based or born out of Canada. Um, it's actually the, one of the top insulating methods in, in North America. So a few conversations later, and we, we eventually in 2008 became the, the first uh, isonine contractor in Scotland. Since then, we've been <coughs> heavily involved with Robert Gordon's university um, in research and development, trying to find better solutions to insulate hard to treat properties. Um, we've done I think four or five projects to date and we've just started another one and we've got another one in the pipeline with them. So we're, we're really proud of our relationship that we have with them um, and about trying to address the, the inefficiency of, of so many properties in Scotland. Um, we've also done a fair bit of work on older properties um, and listed buildings as well. So obviously to go through that and um, you need to have the, the blessing of Historic Environment Scotland. So we're again, we're really proud to have done some projects with them. So everything we do is in-house. We, we don't use any external or third-party sales teams. 
And um, so any prospective job that comes in, um, it would be one of our uh, surveying team that comes out and carries out the survey of the property. And um, they would walk through, uh, look at all the areas where it would be possible for us to install the, the spray foam insulation. Um, one of the main things we do is we make sure that the, the substrate of the structure, and Jamie referenced this quite a lot in his, in his presentation, we need to make sure that everything is suitable for us to apply the, the, the spray foam insulation. So we're looking to make sure that the moisture content of the walls and the timbers are below a certain percent where it could be problematic. And um, we're making sure that the external perimeter of the building is in, in good condition. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about it later on, but for instance, if you've got cement and um, mortar on, a, on an old stone property, that massively restricts the breathability of that stone. So we wouldn't be looking to insulate um, because we, we wouldn't want to cause any problems further down the road. So once a survey has been carried out, it's a, a free survey that we do, um, our surveyors will compile a quote that will get sent out to our customers. Um, if it all goes ahead, either with a Home Energy Scotland loan or if they're funding it themselves or through a, a, a uh, district okay, community loan scheme and um, it would then come through to myself for scheduling and um, we'd make sure that depending on what we're doing the customer is fully aware of, of everything that needs to be done before our arrival and um, our installation team would then go to the property and uh, they would do a walkthrough with the customer identifying how they're going to access certain areas if we're drilling holes we would show where we're going to be drilling these and make sure everything is as expected before they start the work um, all the products that we install from Isonine are uh, have full certification of either, well, both, sorry, uh, the British Board of Aggregate and also Kiwa, which is a European alternative. Um, we have got uh, our PAS 2030 certification, which um, makes us Green Deal approved, which means we can carry out work um, through the Home Energy Scotland loan scheme. Um, we've also signed up to the HICS um, insurance backed warranty scheme which covers the workmanship for up to two years from installation. Um, and as well as that, all of our um, installations come with a 25-year isonine product warranty. So we're, we really uh, strive to, to make sure our customers have the best, the best kind of um, experience with us. And we're, we're really proud of all the positive reviews that we get. Obviously, insulating a property can be a fairly large undertaking, depending on what's what's been going on, especially if there's other measures that are being installed. And if it's um, solar panels or an air source heat pump, there could be quite a lot of, up, lot of upheaval for, for people. So we try to make sure we have somebody to help all along the way. So be it the surveyors initially, and myself before installation, and then our installers when they're on site, just to make sure that our customers are kind of feel like you know they're in good hands we're, we're looking after them we're not just here to to whack some some insulation and we want to make sure that people have a positive experience and um, as ultimately we're, we're making their homes more efficient so this kind of gives a little bit of a, a brief outline as i say I'll, I'll look at each measure a little bit more um, in detail but you kind of um can pigeonhole our, our our services into three different categories so new existing and historic and um, Fairly self-explanatory, to be honest. Uh, new properties are new timber kit builds. Um, so we are essentially a little factory on wheels. So it's a lot more efficient um, having us come to our new build property or even an extension um, and installing the foam on site to the, um, the, the extension or the new build. Um, if you imagine it comparatively, if it was rigid board that you were um, going to be fitting, you've got to cope with fort lifts on site and um, lorries coming in where are you going to store it all the rest of it so we're, we're a lot more efficient and compact in, in that way also means um as i say we're, we're a lot quicker so in the photos there and um, you can see on the bottom left we've got the coomed area here and on this photo this kind of narrow section coming into the the i-beam if you've ever cut rigid board and um, it's a bit of a pig and um, you can spend forever using your off cuts to minimize your waste. You've got it all to tape afterwards to ensure your air tightness. So it's a very time consuming process. Comparatively with the spray foam insulation, it's a couple of passes with the foam and, and we've got an airtight seal and a, a nicely insulated wall. So um, it's certainly a quicker um, way to insulate new build properties and extensions. Existing buildings, which is probably more of uh, interest to, to everybody here this evening. Um, we have options for masonry, 
cavity walls. Um, you can inject behind lath and plaster. Um, suspended floors, loft insulation, really anywhere that's going to be suitable, um, as I said, with the building fabric, but anywhere we can get into, we can potentially insulate. Um, so here we've got a bit of an example. This was a, a old cottage retrofit where they installed an offset timber frame. Once we applied the foam directly to the stonework, in behind all of these studs here, we achieved a, a really good air tightness with absolutely no cold bridging in the external wall. So it was a really cozy property in the end. Um, and finally, uh, historic buildings. So as I said, we've, we've had uh, the blessing of historic Scotland on many properties. Um, very similar to existing, we can inject in behind lath and plaster, apply to attics, under floors, really wherever suitable. Um, the, Injection process was one that we developed in conjunction with Robert Gordon's university, and it's uh, a really good way of insulating old old buildings with lath and plaster wall linings. What we do, and I'll, I'll show you a little bit later some some photos, but um, it's a way of insulating these hard to treat buildings without damaging the um, the ornate features that are there and obviously are um, are required to be protected. So I've, I've kind of talked about it a fair bit, but uh, what, what is isonine, you might be wondering. So um, it's a spray foam insulation that comes in two, two components. So this image on the right here, we've got our black drums and our white drums. So when we mix these together, it's a one-to-one -one ratio and it uh, creates the spray foam insulation. What it does is it will expand a hundred times its initial volume. So it, uh, it might look like we've got uh, kind of a lot of drums there, but we get a, a lot more material out of it in the end. Um, it's a, well. There's, there's two different uh, varieties of the spray foam. So we get the closed cell and we have the open cell. What we predominantly install is an open cell foam, um, and its open cell nature means that it allows any moisture to diffuse through it. So it won't trap moisture in your walls. It will allow that breathability. Um, I think the good analogy for it is kind of saying it's like Gore-Tex. So we're creating an airtight seal of the property to make sure that warm air that you're paying for stays in your rooms. But equally, we're allowing any moisture to build up. We're allowing that to diffuse through the material and evaporate out into the external. Um, it's a low density foam, so um, it doesn't cause any weight or anything to a structure. Um, and it's, um, yeah, yeah, as I say, I'm repeating myself there. Um, so what we've got is our LDC 50. That's our, our the main foam that we use. Um, you can apply that to, to lofts, to underfloors, which we would install to a new build or an extension. We've got our LDP50, so that's the pore variant that I said we can inject in behind wall linings. It's exactly the same foam as the LDC50, but it has slightly less catalyst in it. So basically, the LDC50, when the two components um, mix together, they will rapidly expand and you'll have a hard foam in five seconds. So it's really, really quick. In comparison, the pore having less catalyst in it, it'll take kind of 10 to 15 seconds before it starts to expand. So that enables us to inject it behind a wall lining. It stays viscous for longer, so it'll pour down and then start to expand up. The LDC 70 we've got is a slightly more rigid foam. And um, again, it's open cell, so it allows that, that breathability, um, but it has a slightly nicer finish to it. Slightly better, um, Thermal, effic thermal efficiency to it as well. Um, but we have a slight, the yield isn't as great, so it's a slightly more expensive option. And finally, we've got the cavity closed cell formula. So um, that's a closed cell product, so we would only ever install that between the um, inner and outer brick skin of a cavity building. So as I say, we're a little factory on wheels. So what we have is our, our main van that houses our generator. And in the back of our trailer here is what we have our material, we have our reactor and a compressor. So what we need to do is make sure that we're heating the material up to 60 degrees Celsius and it will travel through a heated hose to the application gun where the installers are then applying it. So we are, as I say, a little, a little factory on wheels. This is the injection process that I mentioned earlier. So this far left picture and um, as you can see, we fully mask out every area that we work in. It can be a fairly messy business, so we make sure everything's protected um, in people's homes, carpets, walls, furniture, everything. Um, we drill 13 millimeter diameter holes in the walls, which 600 millimeters apart. Obviously, depending on the size of the wall, we might need to vary that, but that's what we've established means that we get maximum fill of the wall 
with minimal disruption to the, to the wall lining. And you can see these little worms that are squiggling out. So that's what we want to see when we're doing the installation. That means that we filled the foam all the way up to that level and it's starting to come out of that entry hole. That central photo there, you can see we've cleared it away, just got those holes left and we're starting to, to tidy up after ourselves. So it's a great way of insulating hard to treat areas in pine lath and plaster, but there is full redecoration that would need to be carried out afterwards. The alternative though for these hard to treat areas in these types of property would be to rip down all of that, that lining or um, try and retrofit something externally, which you might not have space for, or um, you might need planning permission depending on where you are. So um, it's a very, what we do is a very good way of, of, uh, of achieving better efficiency of the building. So room and roofs and, and loft spaces. Um, this photo on the left obviously is nice. This is the dream for us, lots of space to move around and, and apply the insulation. What we've done here is we've created a warm roof. Uh, again, Jimmy mentioned this in, in, his, in his presentation. So with a cold roof system, which is what most people will have in their homes, where it's just um, glass or rock wool insulation on the ceiling area, that's a cold roof. So you've got a ventilated space that's drawing all the warm air from your property up into it and it will fluctuate massively. If you've ever been up there in winter, it's freezing, you go up there in summer and it's roasting. So you have huge temperature fluctuations. By creating a warm roof, we don't need to ventilate that space because we're controlling the temperature inside by having all insulated. And as I say, because our foam is open cell, it would allow any moisture in there, in the air naturally to diffuse through it, through the, the starting boards, the breathable membrane that you'll have in your slates and away it goes. Um, on some small cottages um, where we maybe don't have such a big loft space, um, so this bottom right photo here, what we would do is cut a strip 600 mil deep perpendicular to the roof rafters. We can then apply the insulation down towards the wall head and up towards the apex and get a fully insulated roof, creating a warm roof space without too much disruption. Um, the alternative to this, again, as I say, would be to have to rip down the wall linings and install something and then replasterboard the whole thing. So whilst the, there is a little bit of disruption, it's, it's a lot less than, than you would have with your more traditional methods of insulating. The top right image there is an example of, of a dormer. And so dormer, dormers are notoriously bad um, areas for, for heat loss. You know, you've, you've got your roof, your first floor, second floor, and you've got a little bit protruding out. So the wind really catches and pulls any, any warm air out through there. So again, with this, we would cut a hatch in the top section, insulate up there and inject into the cheeks on the side. So fully insulating everything. Um, Underfloors, oh sorry, uh, nice and nice and straightforward. Um, with an underfloor area, we would make sure that the sole and vents are maintained because obviously you've, you've got the potential for drown, uh, ground moisture to come up. So we need to make sure that area is kept ventilated, but we've got that airtight seal underneath, so you're not having any cold air coming up into your rooms. We're also able to apply to garages as well. So if you spend a lot of time doing woodwork or tinkering with vehicles or whatever in your in your garages you may find that in winter when you've got your heaters on you get a huge condensation build up as that warm air is hitting the cold surface of your metal roof for instance we can apply the, the insulation to those roof areas and um, like 100 mil or something thick would be completely sufficient for for stopping that that warm air escaping out of your your garage spaces and again that central image there the customer was intending to to plasterboard everything as well so we, he had a nice finish and um, the one on the right, they were just going to leave it open. They were quite happy to, to have the foam uh, open and exposed like that. So that's all I've got. I've probably rattled through that a lot quicker than my, my time allowance. Um, but hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what we do and the kind of potential installations that we could carry out um, a little bit more about spray foam insulation. That's great, Mike. Thank you for that. It's a good presentation. Um... Any questions? Have we got anyone coming in with? I have a couple myself. If um, if we haven't got any, well, they're actually from some um, emails people asking before. Uh, so I'll go ahead. Um, and if anyone else comes up with anything, do 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 ask it. Um, so regarding ice and spray foam insulation. Uh, we heard as older buildings weren't built with this in mind, can it sweat and cause damp? No, so um, 
presumably the person that wrote the email was maybe thinking of a laugh, laugh and plaster building. Um, so what you'd have with a traditional lath and plaster building is you'd have your lath and plaster, a, a gap of anything tends to vary from 40 to 80 millimeters, and then your old stone wall. So what's mm. happening at the minute is you, you have your warm air in your room, it's wicking through the, the lath and plaster, and it's got that airflow around it into vents into the soul or up into the roof space, and it's allowing that moisture to, to naturally disperse throughout the building. Because mm. of the insulation or the the, the insulation we would apply to that area, which would be open cell, it allows that moisture to still diffuse through the insulation, through the stone or up or whatever, through the, you know, a warm summer's day, it would still draw it out through it. So it doesn't hold that moisture in and against any timbers. If you wrongly install a closed, a closed cell insulation into that cavity, you absolutely would have problems because it isn't allowing that breathability and it's holding everything in place. So it's really the key mm. that open cell. That's that's the key to it. Yeah. Do you ever recommend that clients would look at their ventilation after you've installed your product to see, make sure they've got extractor vents in the bathroom and kitchen, for example? Yeah, yeah. You, you would want to make sure that you, you've got that ventilation there. But I kind of, it's a difficult one because I kind of think in the real world, you know, people open windows in the summer, you, you've got doors opening, you're mm. opening windows, there's that natural movement of air, you know, nobody lives in their house with their doors shut and their windows shut constantly. If you mm. did that, then you would be running a risk, but you'd be running a risk if you didn't have the insulation there as well. And um, so, you know, we all have vents in our windows, having those open would, would certainly help. Okay. Um, quick one. Uh, there's somebody that's heard that there's an issue with spray foam in, in, in English properties that they've led to mortgage issues um, for trying to get mortgages on the property afterwards. Yeah, so it is something yeah. that we're aware of recently. Um, it's, it's a real frustration for us because it's, it's kind of typical of, <laughs> of, of the UK. Um, new innovative products come along that, that really fit the bill. Um, as I say, it's, it's used all over the world. Um, but our legislation and our mortgage companies seem to be lacking behind the curve with these innovative products. So you can get mortgages on it, but I have heard from various customers of ours in the past that they've struggled or they've not had the variety of choice that they would have had. And um, mm -hmm. it's something that we've raised with Isonine um, and the spray foam industry as a whole, there's lots of other products out there. And um, it's, it's going to be a meeting, I believe it's the end of June, and between UK finance and the home, the body that represents home surveyors, so to with the intention to update their um, their criteria to have a list of approved products and um, okay. so likes of Isonin, you know, it, it's got all the accreditation because that's the thing. We have full accreditation to install into properties. So it's not a um, an unlicensed product that's being installed, it's fully certified. Mm. but it's the legislation is lacking behind that approval. So we've been told that it should be rectified kind of middle to the end of the year. Um, okay. But yeah, it, it certainly is something we're aware of happening. Okay, that's great. Thanks, Mike. All right. Anyone uh, else? Yeah, yep. I can ask a quick question if I may. Um, you talk about the product as being breathable mm -hmm. and uh, you'll know that obviously in many old properties and part of mine is like this, it was built on a gravel gravel base with no no insulation between that and the wooden floor inside mm -hmm. the air rattles underneath the floor goes up the walls through the loft so the the flow of air around what is 200 year old beams and wood mm -hmm. is is enormous so to what extent does i mean there's clearly a restriction on air movement and the dispersal of condensation with any uh, any foam surely um would would you have concerns about looking at properties that had 200 year old timbers and were have you know a rapid air movement around them and um, we wouldn't have any concerns so as i say when, when we would carry out the survey we would be checking those timbers obviously it's most easiest to do that in the roof space if we can get to the underfloor that's good as well and um, 
we like we check behind the, the the wall lining so we would remove a socket for instance and, and have a look at what's going on looking for signs of damp and mold and um, but also making sure that the moisture content of the timbers is, is at an appropriate level for us to install that air movement that you mentioned just now obviously that's drawing out all because laws of physics warm goes to cold so the minute that's pulling all of the warm air that you're paying to heat your space up it's just going into your walls, into your solum, into your loft space and, and away into the, the, the outside. Again, as I said, that's there because it's it's preventing that buildup of, of, of moisture. But because the spray foam is open celled, it's not holding that moisture in place. It's, it's still allowing that moisture to move through the, the insulation. And with the, the gravel, the sorry, the gravel solum that you mentioned, we would obviously we wouldn't block any ventilation to that area because you have ground moisture potentially coming up. So that area would still be still be ventilated. Thank you. Great, thank you. I think that's everyone now. Um, can you see anyone, Tina? Yeah, well, thanks, Mike. And are you staying for the yeah, next? Yeah, yeah, yep. no, absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Okay, so I'll move on because we're already at 10 past eight, so I'm going to share a screen on behalf of J.D. McKenzie. Um, okay. Hi, James. Are you still with us? Hmm. Have we lost James? Unmute. Oh, you there you now? Are. You got yeah, me? I can hear you now. Right. Yep. Right. Yep. Great. So, do you, would you like to introduce yourself, James? Hi. Yep. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for having me here. Uh, my name is James McKenzie, on behalf of JD McKenzie Construction Limited, doing external wall insulation. I've never made up a presentation for this evening because I didn't really know what was happening. However, the first two gents on actually gave my presentation. First guy spoke about Eon doing the Highlands. Well, I'm presently engaged doing the Highland work for Eon. Second guy spoke about Fintray with the Stirling District Council. Well, I was fortunate enough to be involved in that job and I successfully carried out all the insulation in Fintray for the for Stirling District Council. Uh, basically, um, I do external wall insulation. I'm past 2030 accredited with all the stuff that go with that. And I would rather people ask me questions than me telling you what I'm about. Okay. That's okay. Well, what we'll do is we'll, I'll just jump straight to the next yep. photo for you, James. Please do. So this, Please is, do. this is a survey we did the other day and there's, a, there's someone here that would probably recognize this house. <laughs> That's Mike there. Yeah. So this is an example of a house that um, traditional type where you external. might think, does it need external insulation? So um, I think we'll allow James to make that case. No, so I here never... we have an example. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that, that was before and after, well, yeah, sorry, when you go. It's not quite before and after because it's a very similar yeah. house that James Definitely did in house. the sky. Yeah. yeah. So tell us a bit about, so this is a, Solid masonry wall, is it, James? It was a solid wall. Uh, just it's like Mike's house before that, and they were having problems mm -hmm. with obviously with dampness, with coldness, and they applied to the Highland Council, but the, who came surveyed it and suggested or I suggested external wall insulation, mm -hmm. which Eon as a main contractor was. Uh, they were engaged to do, and myself as a approved applicator, I carried out the works on behalf of him. Okay. So a lot of these, are, that's the gable there, isn't it? There? Gable, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. So what we're looking at here is um, basically the external insulation has been applied to the existing building. And because it's a traditional building, you've had to the, put the, a capping piece there. Yeah. Because the insulation comes out 90 mil, 100 mil overall, then sticks out by the, the slate, so you need a verse trim at the top, which protects the whole system. It's been 
uh, bonded mm -hmm. on bonded onto the existing wall with uh, low silicon mastic to ensure that there's no water penetrating it. Okay, okay. It's and the whole... same across the below the gut is there, isn't it? There's a trim there. Yeah, there's a trim below the gutter as well, yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. This is a more modern type construction. Tell us about this house. This is a prefab single story house. Again, I, I think it's got, I think it had a 40 mil cavity, which if you injected that with foam, it wouldn't they bring it up to the, the view val the U values that's required for the for the new carbon footprint. So again, the solution was to insulate externally. Mm -hmm. Which which we've and done there. And right. you can see that there was a lot less um you got an overhanging eave here, so you didn't have to do that detail at the top. You just yeah, the, the, the stuff that, the, I'll show another photograph, yeah. 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 That's so, yeah. right. As you see, the insulation comes uh, it's a 90 mil insulation with 10 mil rough cast, mortar rough cast. So that it's giving you overall about 105 mil maximum. If you have a soffit that's 150 or more, you don't need to protect the top. The soffit protects it itself, mm -hmm. which is why there's no burst trims at the top of that. Tell us a bit about this. Um, if, you, if you look at the door, you'll area. see there is a small burst trim there. Oh, yeah. That's yeah, around the extension. <clears throat> Yeah, James, the, the, yeah. Is is there a choice of finishes that you can put on top of the uh, insulation? I mean, you talk about applying a rough cast. Yeah, can you can you have, apply one of the more modern renders, such as yeah, um, the acrylics. The spray stuff. You, talk, you can you can you can put any finish you like as long as it's a polymer finish. What we're finding new, especially with Swedish timber houses, timber houses. They don't want to carry. They don't want to put the weight of rough cast on, so they come up. So we, we now have an acrylic finish, which is it's like a smooth render. But it's, it's, it's it goes on two more render, thing. something like that. Mm -hmm. K, K, ah, there are various different ones, K end things like that. But it's two mil thick rather than ten mil thick, so obviously it's a fifth of the weight on the house, especially in a timber house. Aye. Tell us a bit about the this house again. Um, the insulation is planted hard onto the onto the stone. There's no air gap behind it, is there? there there's no that the, the ins that shows you the fixings here. It's hmm. uh, the the polystyrene is screwed right back to the substrate directly mm -hmm. onto it. With with obviously for a, a base track to hold the system up to give you a, a level which starts at the DPC level. And, and, and if it were a yeah, so yeah. if it were a timber house, would you have an air gap? If it was a timber house, yeah, you would have a 15 mil thick uh, aluminium strips going right round the house, which the insulation would be fixed onto. So the mm -hmm. insulation is not actually getting fixed onto the timber, which lets the timber breathe. Right. Okay. Um, and I was just going to say about this um, sky area, obviously, when there's something that you need to take off you'll have to take it off and you put a piece of timber behind there after right. this well, yeah. normally on, when we're working on buildings there's a scaffold there if you have a sky dish or an aerial you'll take them off you put them onto the scaffold realign them so that the house owners can get use of their tvs however in this case there's no scaffold there so we've got to insulate it and when we're ready to take that we take the, we take the sky dish off we'll fix the insulation with a timber bat to hold the sky dish will replace this, we'll put the sky dish back on again, line it up so that people have got access to their TV. And when we're ready to insulate it, we'll take it off again in the morning. Uh, sorry, when we're ready to render it, we'll take it off, we'll do the a tease of a mesh and put it mm -hmm. back on again so that the householder has use of the TV at night. Great. So in and this case, this is only because there's no scaffold there mm -hmm. to line it up. And, and new down pipes and what happens to the the, yeah, the down pipes and things? because we are extending the system a hundred mil, all down pipes must as you as, all down pipes must be taken off. If it's cast, you can't renew, renew. Uh, sorry, reuse. So you've got to replace it with new PVC pipes. As you can see in this building, 
We've got to suffer there. Therefore, we didn't need to touch the gutters. So the gutters remain in place as they are. Mm -hmm. But all, all DPC, uh, all down pipes and all soil pipes, rainwater pipes, must be renewed because you're extending the system 100 mil. Okay. Presumably, if you didn't want UPVC, you could you could have aluminium or something like that. Ah, uh, yeah, whatever, whatever you choose. Yeah, it's only yeah. as I say, the last three, four, five years, I've been working with the Eons and the Stirling districts, mm. and obviously for for speed and cost, it's all been PVC. But the house owner can choose what they want. Yeah. The likes of my place that you looked at the other day, there, James. Yeah. We've been needing to replace all the guttering and downpipes on mine. Yep. Yeah, well, in your case, in your house, you don't have a protruding soffit. Mm -hmm. Your your gutters are actually just a bit flush with the wall, with ah. the walls. Yeah. So in that case, they will need to be taken out, need to be taken down, and renewed beyond the system. So your gutters will have to be renewed anyway. Yeah. As well as well, the downpipe. So that that's a that's a foregone conclusion that you you would need them sort of do it mm -hmm. like. And uh, looking at this photo now, James, uh, what yeah. stage are we at? That's been boarded. It's now at the adhesive and scrum stage. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you lay a bed of adhesive on the wall, a coat of adhesive, five mil thick, and you embed the scrum in it while it's still wet, till it all in, and then give it a light scratch for the key for the top coat, which in this case is rough cast. Okie dokie. <clears throat> That's another shot from the this. That's the. Hmm. That's the adhesive that's been put on a day or two before it's now cured, ready for rough casting. And that's a finished rough cast wall. Mm -hmm. It's a bit patchy there because that's because of the rain. I thought I've took a photo in the rain and obviously we'll, yeah. rain blotches yeah. the camera. I think we'll let you off with that. There's a few blotches <laughs> elsewhere as well. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, so this is another property similar. This is another property in four yep. three, mm -hmm. Sky. Yep. Again, that's the finished, that's the finished building. You see the white line. That's the earth trims going up round the system to accommodate the system because the the slates are flush with the wall. So we need to protect the polystyrene and rough cast that overlaps. What's the, <clears throat> what's the guarantee in the the lifespan of this system? Would you say? Um. Well, well uh, most. Companies give 25 year guarantee. In fact, all companies give 25 year guarantee without fail. Mm -hmm. Have you been back to a property after 25 years? <laughs> <laughs> Thankfully, no. Although no. I've been at it now, I've been at it now for 27 years. So, in fact, I've mm -hmm. been back to properties in Stirling that I've done over 20 years ago and they're still looking good. Good. Here's a Again, that capping detail. Um, that's a capping detail there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that's this is at more the stage now. It's been scrubbed. Ah. Okay, we're and actually going I, back. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, Carry yeah. On, can, John. I, can I can I just ask? Instead of the trim that covers the uh, extension of the wall, are there circumstances under which one could extend the the tile on the gable end? You could extend the roof, but it's very costly. It's very costly. You need to. What you need to do is you need to build up a timber below the line of the roof then you've got to take so many the slate back you've got to put uh, the damp proof course under the slate and then you've got to extend the slate which it's it can be done i've done it before but it's very costly so that that, that extension is done before you start applying the insulation on you the must do wall. it you must do it before you put the insulation yeah. on the wall okay. yeah got it yeah. thank you yep <laughs> Yeah, and that's the scratch coat stage on the previous property, isn't it? Yeah, that's the base coat stage. Base coat, scratch coat, yeah. Yeah. And again there. And again there, yep. Yeah. And there, that's the base coat again. And the window protection, that's standard. Uh, yeah, window protection. You need, to, you need to, you've got to put window protection on, stops the dust flying into it. And if you put, if you get dust or cement, drops and you start washing the windows down there's a possibility you could scratch your windows mm -hmm. so if you if you protect it it's done and this house is um how this, is this, is in, hmm. this was a prefab house palmacara and isla sky 
again, that's you're at the the boarding stages there. Mm -hmm. um, are these vents at the bottom here? They you... there, there are the. I'm just looking to see where you can if you can see the vents. There's something down there. Look. Yeah. Uh, where where are we? Sorry. Uh, uh, that's a vent. Yeah. Yep. That's a vent, and along the front, I don't think I took photos of the front, but. Just so under the surf, yeah. under the surfit there, just under the surfit, the white yeah. surf, the white that there, there, you can see there are some vents there. Mm -hmm. So any but, protrusions, any uh, flues, etc., you have to extend them as well for like a we gas have, boiler. Or... We've got to keep everything as original. If there's a if there's a vent in the original building, we've got to follow that vent. Mm -hmm. Overflows, anything has got to be followed. To exact and it's always inspected by either warm works or change works before the building is passed. Okay. And here we've got an example where you couldn't move the down pipe and you had to do a sort of wee box around it, yeah? Oh fair away. Right. All right, I right, right, I've got you here. I, there are cases where you can uh, that's actually a um, soil pipe at the bottom there, mm -hmm. I think it was. Yeah. We couldn't take it out because it, it was too close to the wall and you, we couldn't move the whole thing out because you, we, what we had to do, we looked at it, if we had to take that out, we had to open a big hole a metre wide to get into the existing drain in conjunction with the Heinel Council, we all agreed to bridge around it, as you can see with the, with, with the tracking, mm -hmm. leave, leave a 50 mile gap either side of it for access in the future if anything ever goes wrong. Okay, okay. So that's that's the end of our slideshow there, James. So if thank anyone's you got any questions, Good. welcome, thank you. It was quite interesting, James, uh, with the Fintry um, project, that obviously there was quite a bit of um, development trust money went into that. It looks yeah. like an expensive process. And obviously, as far as uh, government assistance concerned, uh, Jamie will probably confirm that you can get up to 10,000 for yep. external wall installation. Uh -huh. Is that right? I know that yeah, uh, there are most places that the government is, yes, is, is telling you you can get 10,000. I mean, for no, the ABS, so it's a problem because the council's yeah. putting the bill for those. Yeah. But for private homes, go on then, Jamie. Yeah, so uh, you kind of covered what I was going to say there. So through the ABS scheme or through Warmer Home Scotland, there'll be government grant. Outside of that, it's interest-free loan with cash back up to to forty percent. Um, yeah. But for most most private uh, house owners who, I mean, the, the the council are very they target the areas that they carry the ABS is out on. So not yeah. everybody's got access to the ABS scheme. Is that right? So there's criteria based on council tax bands, uh, wall type as well. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, there's they, they've got an eco flex scheme as well, which is based on benefits um, and income. So, but the the general area based schemes uh, based on council tax bands. So A to C council tax bands with a solid wall or timber frame wall. Um, and council tax ban D if you've got low energy rating. So for those folk who don't qualify for grants and have to go down the interest-free loan cashback route, should they wish to do it, £10,000, is that likely to cover a job like that? No. So realistically, what I'm getting at is that obviously in Fintry, the community did make a contribution towards that through the development trust, which is what we are kind of trying to do here as well. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, a typical three, four bedroom house might cost as much as 20,000 to insulate externally. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Bungalow a bit less. I do which know is, that people. Which, the, the point being that if it's too expensive, people ain't going to do it, which is the, the age old problem, really, which is why we've got to 
encourage a community project to make this sort of stuff happen, really. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely. That's why we're all here, isn't it? To, yeah. To sort of learn and look at, get the facts on the table and, and, and speak to the installers and the funders. And oh, it's been very good. I've got a question from Sue um, that was probably for Kishon Insulation about uh, if there was active woodworm, would it still be active um, after the measure? So we would we wouldn't install if there's if there's woodworm present, and um, you need to get it treated before we insulate. And um, the foam itself, it's not a, a food source for mold or for for beasts of any type or mice or anything. They won't gnaw through it. It's got no nutritional value, but at the same time, it wouldn't solve the problem. And um, it would just mask it. So if you had woodworm, you would need to get it treated properly first. Although. Um, from my experience as a joiner, uh, woodworm basically requires a certain temperature, a certain humidity to remain for it to be a, an attractive proposition for it. So if you can reduce the humidity and also up the temperature, it isn't that keen on that. So quite often woodworm is associated with underheated houses or where there's a problem with insulation in the first, not having any insulation in the first place. Very good. Um, uh, any more questions? Jamie. Yep. Jamie, I'm valuation band E on my council facts. So basically, does that mean I'm not going to get a thing? So you wouldn't get it through the Highland Council, no. So you wouldn't get it through EON, through the area based scheme. So you wouldn't get the upfront grant. So, so I wouldn't get, basically I wouldn't get a grant, I'd have to get a loan and cash back. And that exactly, be yeah. So the best I'm going to get is 40% then. Yeah, that's correct. Up to, well, if you include room in the roof, um, you'd get up to 6,000 cash back and up to 14,000 in total. Mm -hmm. So again, Maybe making... Yep. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I am pretty stuff, basically. <laughs> yes. Well, we'll have to wait and see. I mean, uh, you're one of the you, you're at the forefront of this surveys, and you know, one other. <clears throat> so hopefully, we'll have everything in place. And if, in the event the grant did come off, you would be able to act quite quickly. So we really must say this to everyone that's present here. At, you know, do get in touch. And um, if there's anything I can do to help, I'll be here to, you know, help organize any surveys. If you're any, interested in any of these systems or products, I think it might be suitable in your home. Um, so we've had the two, 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 sur two property surveys so far, uh, actually three all, all in. Um, and that's since the restrictions <coughs> lifted and we were able to go out. Mm. Uh huh. Sue got the answer to a question, but there was a spider up her sleeve while she <laughs> she says, <laughs> "Are you all right now, Sue?" <laughs> yes. Great. <clears throat> Hi, Pam. How are you? Oh, hello. Why have hello. I just appeared? <laughs> oh, you're there. You've got your mic on. Yeah. Oh, yes, I've been That's listening fine. all the time. Mm. Yes, uh, I found that very helpful. Mm -hmm. Great. That's good. Uh, but it will be more helpful for someone to see my building. <laughs> mm -hmm. Because I didn't see anything like that. Well, maybe the historic houses. <laughs> yeah. Fit the bill. I well, when know. you're ready, just just let me know. Yes, well, I yeah. told you, just give me plenty of warning. <clears throat> okay. <laughs> now I'm just seeing I was actually going to do a wee presentation but we are running a bit late now so um, I think maybe we should and I'm also having a bit of a technical issue here let's see if I can get it working again well I'm <clears> expecting <throat> a Tesco delivery so I'd like to say good evening <laughs> okay <laughs> yeah. because he always appears outside and I never see him and it gets a bit frantic 
So yeah. it's been very interesting and very helpful. Bye bye, everyone. Very nice good. Thank you. Pat. Bye, Pam. Bye. Bye. I'll bye. run very, I'm going to run very quickly through uh, doors and windows. So you, that's you're obviously you're another area. Sorry, yep. you're I'm going to have to go as well, I'm afraid. Um, okay, my, you're my, welcome. my apologies. Um, that's just, okay. Just, just before you leave, Gordon, as I said at the beginning, you don't mind us getting in touch with you guys because obviously what we're trying yeah, to do sure. is, yeah. is very much the same as what you guys have achieved, but from a different direction of travel. Yeah, you know, but, yeah. No, that's, that's absolutely fine. But the end game is still, as a community, decarbonizing ourselves and getting everybody in healthy, well-being houses. So yeah. no doubt yeah. you'll hear from us. Yeah, no, no, I look, I look forward to it. Super, yeah. thanks. Thank you very Thank you. much, Gordon. Thank you much. Thanks, Gordon. Yeah, yeah. Nice yeah. thanks. Great Th to have thanks you very along. much. Right. Yeah. Cheers. Bye. Cheers. Bye. 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 So very quickly, windows and doors. Obviously, um, everyone knows that double glazing will generally be a good thing. Um, sometimes uh, the funding isn't available to replace all the double glazing. So that's something that we're looking at. Uh, as government district is, is making a, a grant that is eligible to replace all the double glazing that was maybe installed in the 80s or, or 90s even where it's things have failed and you can no longer get parts to replace um, the glazing etc. Um, <clears throat> just rattle on here so this is an example of an older property with PVC windows and doors. We can't okay. see you and be sharing something. Can you see it? No. Nope. Oh dear, we're having that technical problem again. Sorry. Can we share it? I shall try again. Maybe I didn't actually share it. Okay. That may have explained things. There you go. Here we go. So yeah. Perfect. So I think this is probably a, a to basically would have been a traditional design. It's sash and case windows, so they've installed a, a PVCU equivalent here. And then we also have <clears throat> the more modern style windows from Scandinavia, which are generally very well manufactured and you have the timber option internally. Sometimes they've got aluminium planted on the external side, so they're very maintenance free. Um, Generally, they're more suited to modern properties, and if you've got an older property with very unsquare ingos, then they can be problematic to install. But certainly good in a new build and for certain replacement projects. Secondary glazing is something that um, is funded, I believe. Um, but generally, I would say you're best looking at replacing the window frame um, but in certain period properties where you might have a large expanse of glazing like this, where you want to keep that traditional look, then it could be an option. And that's the end of my presentation there, just very briefly. So thank you very much. And it's been really good having you all here. Um, any other questions before we round up? Great. Okay, well, um, I guess everyone's wanting to get to their dinner and things. Mm. Oh, there's a new message. That's all right. It's just saying thank you. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Sadie's very kindly saying thank you. Nice to have you, Sadie. Yeah, and thank you very much to my guest speakers, um, Mike and James. That's great to have you here, and uh, I hope it will be your worth, worth your while and you'll get some work out of it one day. <laughs> Thanks for That's, having us. Uh, and it's, it's been a pleasure yeah. to be on that today. Bye okay. Up. Okay. Nice to see you. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Thank you. Thank you, Tina. Bye. 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 I hope Bye. to see you next week, Bye. by the way. Thank you, Jamie, as well. I forgot. Yeah. No, it's okay. <laughs> it's popped up there. <laughs> I've got that, so can, used to your Jimmy, face. Jimmy, can, can, you, can you follow me, Jamie's number? Good. Yeah, is that all right, Jamie? Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay, I'll do that. Right, magic. Bye, everybody. Okay. Bye, okay. Cheers. Bye, bye. 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 bye.